This is Larry Benko, call sign W0QE, and this is another Sim Smith video. RF transformers in general are one of the more less understood and more difficult to simulate uh, components, especially in a program like Sim Smith. Uh, capacitors, inductors, resistors, etc., uh, are much much simpler, easier to understand, certainly easier to debug uh, in a circuit. And uh, transformers are kind of like left out in, in a space of like being art in a lot of ways. However, uh, SimSmith uh, does a lot to help somebody who has partial knowledge of a, of a topic to really understand it. The, um, the strength of SimSmith is not in teaching RF uh, concepts, but in letting you understand something you already partially know. So let's um, begin the video. with what I'm going to build here. The process is going to be I'm going to build some stuff, measure it, we're going to simulate it and see how well it actually matches what we um, what we measure. This well, how much well the simulations match. I'm going to start off with a couple of FT50-61 ferrite cores. They have permeability of 125 nominally. I wound them like this, They're, they were initially both one like this, nine turns, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine turns, fairly tightly twisted, number 30 gauge enamel wire, about seven turns per inch. Uh, from some f old, um, let's see, from some old um, uh, documentation on IEEE 1971, uh, shows impedances like in the, you know, in the, uh, in the 100 to 40 ohm range for 30 gauge wire of various, uh, various insulation types, etc. So um, we're going to wind these cores, we're going to measure them, and we're going to measure them every which way uh, we possibly can, can and see what Sim Smith can do to help us. So to begin with, let's start off by taking this core, let's connect both of these two wires, connect these two wires together, connect these two wires together, and let's measure the impedance from this point to this point. Okay, this shows both cores. Uh, one is called, and, and what I did is I made, I made a measurement with my network analyzer. I saved the file and I imported it into, in, into SimSmith. L1 choke.csv is just a text file that has the impedance values versus frequency, uh, the choking impedance, and the same thing for the other core. Um, there's an isolation block here, so we have the first impedance of the first core here and the, and the impedance of the second core here. If you don't understand isolation blocks, they're a really wonderful feature in SimSmith that just lets you repeat the circuit uh, throughout and uh, Consequently, you can uh, line things up side by side very nicely. Here are the two plots shown. Uh, here's the one, here's for L1, and here's L1 and L2 on top of each other. And the numbers are extremely close. Uh, there you see sl some slight variations here. Uh, ferrite cores are not a precise uh, uh, piece of electronics. The permeability varies. The, the, I mean, everything varies. The size of them, the physical size varies a little bit. All kinds of stuff varies. Uh, they're kind of a concoction when that's when they're all mixed together and heated up. Uh, every single batch is a little bit different. However, these two cores are very close and um, good enough that we're going to call them just one one core uh, for the purposes of this discussion. So now we know the choking impedance. The next thing we're going to do is again take take this draw, draw um, picture right here. We're going to look at the impedance measured from here to here without this little wire there with a 100 ohm resistor in the end. I'm using a 100 ohm resistor because as we'll see later on, I'm, I'm going to build a, a transformer that does 250 ohms here. And I'll explain that in a moment. But what we're going to do is we're going to measure the differential impedance from here to here with a 100 ohm resistor on the, out, on the output. When we do that, we get a, I got a file, network analyzer file that I imported into SimSmith. That's the value right here. So if we look at that, that file just right, just right here, it's the, it's the light blue one for component L, the load component. We put an isolation block in there, 
And now we're going to put a piece of transmission line in and we're going to try to simulate exactly what we think we should have had, what we measured. So let's put the transmission line in there also. And we see that it's very well matched, but it's because I've done a little work here. So when I built these, when I built these cores again, uh, I had started off with three quarters of a foot, a foot of wire. I actually started off with about a foot of wire. I twisted, twisted the two pieces together uh, fairly tightly. I cut off the last inch or two, which is always junk whenever you twist stuff. And I had about I had th uh, nine inches of wire when I started. I wound these cores and I cut off the excess. They have about a half inch sticking out here at the, at the end. And the measured distance was 0.53 feet. So I'm going to call that the length of the transmission line. I don't know the velocity factor. I don't know the impedance. They're small little cores. Experience has told me that the transmission line with 30 gauge wire is going to be, you know, three, three, four dB per hundred feet at 10 megahertz. That number doesn't really matter a lot, particularly. It does changes things a little bit, but not a lot. And I'm gonna, and we're going to try to get these two two uh, curves to line up. So the first thing we do is we change the characteristic impedance in it, and we'll see a, a huge difference there as we change that. And we can see that um, uh, when it's closer to 100 ohms, we get very little rotation. Well, it's a 100 ohm load, a 100 ohm transmission line. We ought to see just 100 ohms on the other side. But again, that's not what we built. And the uh, purpose of this experiment is to learn something, not to build what's perfect. So. What we're going to do is we're going to come down here and set it to be where, where it should have been set, before, where, where it matches what we measured. And that turns out to be, by eyeball, 60.5 ohms. And the length, of the, the length of the transmission, well, I can't vary in SimSmith the velocity factor because when I vary the velocity factor, it, it messes with the length at the same time and you don't see any, you don't see any action taking place. What uh, I can do, though, is I can change the length. And if I change the length, I figure out the, the correct length, and then I can go back and see whatever length I had and, and set it to be the right number and then get a velocity factor from that. And when I do that, leaving this to be constant 0.53, I come up with a velocity factor of 0.735. And that's what I'm going to call the transmission line in these little cores. This matches quite well, and let's just, you know, let's move on. So now I've measured two parameters of the little core. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build this exact circuit right here. This is the ground side of my network analyzer. This is the hot side. I'm going to measure the impedance across here. This hot wire right here ends up being right there. So it connects back to ground. And then this is, then this is the ground wire over here on the other side of the 100 ohm resistor. So this circuit acts kind of like an inverter. Uh, if the If the uh, delay in this transmission line is very, very small, the polarity of the signal out here will be exactly opposite of what it is here. So basically, this um, file right here, and again, another thing with SimSmith is if, you, if when, the, when the text gets too small here, and you can, of course, increase it, make it, make it large, but then you don't want to leave it that way because everything else doesn't have enough space to, be, uh, to exist. I can hover over it, I see up here on this blank line. So look at the blank line, when I hover over here, it tells me what the value uh, is in that uh, block. When uh, this is the, the scan value from the network analyzer again of the circuit I just described, and this is three different flavors of simulation. The first flavor is, uh, is this circuit right here. The second flavor of simulation is this circuit, and the third flavor, the third flavor is this circuit. So what we've what we've done different. All of these, you can see the the, the port coming in and and it, and it sw uh, switches on the output side. However, this one has got the choking impedance for for the uh, transmission line on the bottom side of the transmission line. This one has it on the top, and this one has it on both sides. But the value is twice the magnitude of if it's just on one side. Turns out all three of those simulate very very close. I had some questions in my mind whether or not this was a better simulation than one of these others, uh, particularly at low frequencies and stuff, but uh, it appears that they all simulate, at least in this particular example, quite, uh, quite similarly. 
So if we look at the, the four curves here, we see they're almost exactly on top of each other. They're, they're not exact, exact, but the green curve is the measured value. And the others are, they're, they're pretty close. At 50 megahertz, if the green curve is considered to be the gold standard since it's the measured value, it's 90.3 ohms minus J16.4. This one, which is furthest away, is 88.7, 17.9. That's still pretty darn close. And on the low frequency end, it's they're even closer. So, um, what do we what have we learned from this? Well, we've learned uh, we've learned a couple things. One is that the that this choke does not have enough choke. Uh, this transformer does not have not have enough choking impedance at the low frequencies. Uh, clearly, we've also learned that the uh, uh, where we place the cho where we place the choking impedance on which side of the transmission line doesn't appear to matter at the moment. So let's leave the single transmission line um, transformer and go to a more complicated circuit. So now what we're going to do is we're going to build this circuit, and this circuit is this circuit. It's a standard four to one balanced unbalanced transformer. Uh, a transmission line here which nominally should be 100 ohms. This one should be 100 ohms too for the transmission line impedance. We feed the two transformers right here, feed them in parallel, we take the output in series. So if the generator generates V volts here, we'll see V here, it generates V here, we'll see V here, but across from here to here we'll see two V since these are in series. Now if we look at this um, circuit down here, we'll see that I've come along and I've taken a piece of Delrin and uh, used it to hold the, tr hold the um, two cores together. I've wired the leads to this little block on the bottom. There's two 100 ohm resistors there, which represent R1 and R2. I can then, uh, there's a little teeny white wire here that can move the point here, here, or here to ground if I want. These two pins coming up, this is the ground pin that, that goes into my network analyzer, and this is the hot side. And I'm going to use this as the measurement uh, measurement device from here on. So, with that having been said, let's go back and look at the next uh, next slide. So this slide's got a lot of information on it, maybe too much, but uh, effectively there are four ways. I should get this circuit back here for a moment. There are four ways that we. Well, actually, I measured more than four, but I only did I only did simulated four of these. There are there are four things I simulated. One is this this is a measurement again four to one none none means there's nothing else out here. So it is a 100 ohm resistor 100 ohm resistor. We can see that right here. And for all 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 of these circuits right here, I simulated them as if there was a choking impedance on both sides of the transmission, transmission lines. So we have 200 ohm load here with no connections to ground or anything else. The next circuit is called 4, four to 1 bottom. It's the bottom side of this circuit is connected to ground. The next circuit is 4 to 1 mid. Midpoint is connected to ground. And not surprisingly, the last one is 4 to 1 top, where the top side is connected to ground. So that's four different ways of looking at the circuit. We could also look at it with capacitances or whatever we wanted here. And by changing the resistor values, we can move those or the capacitance around too. And that probably represents the, the bulk of what you would ever put on the output of, of this circuit. So. Let's go back and look at these particular circuits just for a minute, because they're, they're pretty interesting. Right now what I'm showing, let's, let's, we're going to show nothing. The first thing we're going to show is what is measured with a, with a 4 to 1 balance circuit with just the 200 ohm resistor here and nothing else. What we see is a circuit that goes through 50 ohms pretty nicely at one frequency. Down here it, it falls off. It falls off for a couple reasons. Um, primarily, it's the fact that our transmission line is 60 ohm transmission line, not 100. And it falls off up here 
because there's not, not enough choking impedance in the um, in the cores. Uh, so that's probably the easiest one to to to, uh, to give a good result with. Let's look at the second one. The second one is with the bottom grounded. Well, that's a more difficult circuit to do, especially at low frequencies. If we ground the bottom point here, this transformer, this transmission line is basically shorted out. This side's ground, this side's ground also. So it's a, t it's a tougher thing to, it's a tougher job for, the, uh, for it to give a good impedance, especially at the lower frequencies. Let's look at the midpoint one, which is D. And what we see, D looks a lot like the first one, except at the low frequencies, we see the effect of the ground connection into midpoint. And the last one, of course, is the top, with the top grounded, and that's going to be the hardest one to match. And, of course, what we see is a much wider impedance excursion from the expected 50 ohms at the low frequencies, indicating that our choking impedance here is totally inadequate for that particular circuit. Well, this is all nice, but let's get rid of this. And what I wanted to show here more than anything else is how close do our simulations match what we measured. So let's close. Let's, this, this gets awfully busy quickly. So here's our first measurement with just the 200 ohm resistor across the output. And here's our simulation data at F. Uh, zoom in on this. They look pretty close. I have made one change in this circuit, and that is I've changed the velocity factor from what used to be 0.735 to 0.66. The insertion of this nasty little Delrin um, insulator in the center here. Delrin has got a is a a plastic that's not too bad at RF. It's not real good, but it's not too bad. But it's got a, a dielectric constant of about three and a half, and it's in contact with the wires. It has very high ins, very high resistance, uh, uh, so it's not uh, there's not an insulation issue. But it's but the dielectric is affecting all those wires. This, believe it or not is easily measurable at HF, the effect of this kind of stuff, and we see it right here. We also see that the, well, we don't see it yet, but I made some measurements that are not shown, but the impedance of the transmission line dropped from, from 60 ohms to 59 ohms with, the, with this uh, little Delrin block in there. So anyways, um, moving right along, um, this is really a pretty close match. If we look back at the full Smith chart, you'd say those two lines are almost on top of each other. Uh, there's a bigger variation at the low frequency than there, is, than there is at the high frequency. And at the low frequency, one of the nasty things that happens with um, ferrite uh, materials is they, every, every parameter of a ferrite material is a function of frequency. And I believe some stuff's going on to low frequencies that I didn't uh, account for. When I matched the, the circuits before, um, like, um, go back to this graph for a minute. When I matched these before, I didn't check. We can see there's an error at the low end here that I didn't account for in this circuit, or didn't even didn't even try to. And I think that's part. That's probably most of what's going on. But again, if we looked at these closely, we'd say the the measured value is 30, 36.2 plus J22.1. 35.4, 22.7. That's awfully close. And for a simulation of a little part like the uh, like the circuit we're building, that's probably close enough to... to it's not going to make you do anything different. It's, it's, it's quite close. So the case where we have just the 200 ohm open impedance on the output, um, not, no connection to ground, it simulates it very well. Let's go to the next one. That's the bottom grounded. And that was the measured curve. And here's the simula. Whoops. Let me do that again. There's the measured curve uh, B. And then the simulate. Start again. I'm sorry. There's the measured curve B. The simulated curve is C, which again lines up quite well with B. Let's go to the case where we've got the midpoint grounded. There's the midpoint grounded, the measurement. There's the midpoint grounded with the simulation. Again, very close. And here's the measured impedance of the top grounded, and here's the simulation of that. Again, very good. So at this point in time, um, you'd have to say, you know, the simulation is looking, looking pretty good as far as uh, matching the, um, 
the actual circuit. Let's go a little bit further and look at um, whether or not the issue is, is oops, sorry, the issue has something to do with how we're doing the choking, um, how we're putting the choking impedance in our circuit, or whether it's got to do with parameters that are um, something I just didn't measure at the moment when I did it originally. Um, so let's go and look at, uh, we won't look at all the cases, but there are, there are several cases I did. Here's a case where the bottom is connected. It's, again, it's the four to one ballon. It's this circuit with this connected to ground down here and R3 and C1 not there. And I've done it by RT, which is the top resistor, is 200 ohms. A ground connection here, which is what's RG, and then zero ohms here. And the first circuit here is there's five of these. I'll show them all real quickly here. They're, I'll probably never do this again in my life because I'm, I'm doing this partially to convince myself that, that everything's cool with the, with the simulation. So the first circuit has the choking impedance applied on the top of the transmission line and the top of the transmission line. Here it's the top of the transmission line and the bottom of the transmission line. Here it's the bottom and the top, and here it's the bottom and the bottom, and here it's both sides with twice the values. And if we go back and look at all, there's six curves being plotted here when we do this. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we see all six there. Um, in that case, we see the um, the measured value being considerably off. Oh, it's considerably off because of this this reason right here. Okay, our simulations now match match the measured value more closely. Again, you look at it on a big picture, you'd say the simulation matches it quite well. It doesn't matter where we apply the choking impedance. So from my point of view, I was trying to really understand is it important to, to put the choking impedance on both sides of the transmission line or not? And it certainly appears with another case here that this is not important. Do one more of these here and um, pretty much call it quits then. Um, let's do, um, since the top side is, is a hard one to do, hard, hard one to match, let's see if it, it makes an effect there. So again, same five th circuits, top and top, top and bottom, bottom and top, bottom and bottom, and both sides uh, with, the ch with the choking impedance applied, the measured data, and in five simulated, five simulated versions. And again, this needs to be back to 0.66 due to the Delrin block. And there's our measurements. So at 50 megahertz, if, this, if the measured value is 41.2 minus J7.7, .7, then the worst one we measure is 42.9 minus J6.48. Again, on the big scale, this is pretty close together. It, so it certainly seems to me that it doesn't make any difference where we, where we put the choking impedance. SimSmith does a really nice job of managing to um, uh, simulate what we, what we built which is really nice because now I can put this I can put this kind of a circuit uh, in SimSmith anywhere and have confidence I can use it. Uh, while we're at it, um, might real quickly do a. Um, I guess we could use this one right here pretty easy, pretty easily. Uh, we can turn this circuit into anything. We don't need to, we don't need to look at the measured value anymore. We're just going to look at simulations. We're going to look just at one simulated output value, the orange trace. We can see the importance of if the transmission line length drops, we can see the higher frequencies being closer to 50, closer to 50 ohms from the 200 ohm load. If the transmission line impedance gets closer to 100 ohms, yeah, that didn't work here. 
we're better off too. But what our, our problem in, in, all, in all these cases right now with this bad case of the, having the ground at the, at the top side is very simply the fact we do not have enough choking impedance. And we need more choking impedance, which was part, part of the reason for doing this, uh, doing this example. If I take the choking impedances away so the transmission line looks perfect, what we see right now is a very, very good circuit. So if I take 100 ohm transmission line, which is basically perfect, and I can put my load, the, the 0 and 200 ohms represents, go back to the circuit here again, the 0 and 200 ohms represents 0 on the top, 200 on the bottom, and connection here. So we're tying the top to ground. It's a very, it's a very, good, very good circuit. If we change that around so that it's the bottom is grounded instead of the top, same kind of thing. Uh, if we do what's typically probably more common, which is 100 ohms and 100 ohms, of course it's good. And now let's let's do something a little bit different here. Um, I'm going to put a capacitor in here for a minute. So we put a capacitor in here by making that grounding resistance very, very high. And we put a capacitance right there. And we see that everybody look, everything looks good. However, things that look good are not usually not quite as good as they look. Let's go and go back here again and change our impedance of our transmission line back to around our 60.5 our ohm number. And our length of our transmission line to be back where it was before. and put our choking impedance back in the circuit. And now we start to see that when you put capacitances in the output and the choking impedance is not adequate, you start to see some interesting things happen. I don't know if 100, 100 picofarads is a reasonable number or not there, but very, very, very cool simulations that you can do and we see the effect of uh, that capacitance. If we change this to be 200 and 0, which basically puts all the capacitance now down on the bottom side, we see, we see it again. And I suspect we'll probably see it worse on the top side. Let's just see if that's true. Yep, sure is. That's, that's terrible. And this is terrible enough that I was really concerned that SimSmith might be not doing this correctly. But in reality, I built the circuit, uh, which was quite simple. Just put the capacitor in there. I put, actually, I put 100 picofarads in there. And I measured about a, f a little over a 5 to 1 SWR down here. And this, is, this shows SWR 6 to 1. So um, again, my circuit may, wasn't exactly correct for, you know, for everything uh, here considered. But uh, it's pretty close. I'm, I was amazingly happy with how well this worked how close the simulations uh, match the, um, the actual measured numbers. And again, this is, a, you know, an, another, another, you know, notch in the confidence belt of using SimSmith to, uh, to calculate circuits. And I'd like to reiterate one more time here again that the, uh, you know, the, the power in SimSmith is not in teaching you, teaching you the basics of electronics, but giving you the ability to take what you already know and um, understand it better. And in this case, I think, uh, I think this is a really good example. I may do another video here uh, that instead of using transmission line transformers for, for all the pieces, I may use uh, flux type transformers where the delay in the actual um, windings, uh, the voltage delay in the two windings is such that that causes the um, um, impairment in the impedances you see. Again, hope everyone enjoyed this. and. Um, I'd like uh, to encourage people make comments uh, if you like these videos. Make comments. Let me know what whether you you know what you like or don't like about them. And uh, I'm going to continue to do some more videos, including some uh, beginner videos. And if you sign up um, on the channel here on YouTube, uh, you'll get a free, you'll get an email when I um, when I do the videos. Uh, otherwise, uh, 
uh, you, you know, just check back if you don't if you don't wish to do that. There's uh, I don't get anything out of it. Nobody gets anything out of it. But uh, you get an automatic email if I post something. Anyways, hope everyone enjoyed this. Thanks.